Pete, if everyone could take your seats, please. I call to order the special meeting of the Board of Education of Community Unit School District 201, today, November 29, 2012. And uh, roll call, please. Mr. Armstrong? Here. Ms. Caparelli is here. Mr. Charleston? Here. Charlton? Here. Mrs. Hancock? Here. Mr. Price? Here. Mrs. Thomas? Here. Thanks. It's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda, are there any public comments? Okay, um, then before we um, go to the action item, is there any need, does anybody have any desire to go into closed session to discuss anything before we get to that? No? <clears throat> so then the uh, item on the agenda, action item, approval of negotiated agreement. Um, before we begin, are there any, anybody have any? Well, are we um, doing that or are we doing the Jack thing first. What are we doing? Well, since we got, I mean, we okay, can, yeah, fine. we can follow the. Okay. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> are you uh, um, are you going to do the motion and then discussion, or you want to do discussion and then motion? Discussion. Okay. Discussion. So, does anybody have any comments? Um, I do. Um, okay. Phone because I feel like I have to explain that I am I am going to vote no. Um, on this contract primarily because as structured, uh, the raises on base, while they look modest, once um, they are coupled with the step increases that are incorporated in the schedule, will result in 4% in raises in the first year on average to most teachers. Um, not, not counting or not, not including lane movement, just step movement. Um, so one and a half plus two and a half. I'm assuming a two and a half number for the stuff that's in step in general. Between 2.2 two two. to 2.5. Okay. So we'll call it 2.2 then. Um, so the first year ends up being 3.7. Uh, the second year looks as if it's going to be, you know, something like 4.3. And the third year, um, if CPI comes in at 2, there's a one and a half percent floor, so that would be another, you know, um, 3.7. Between those three years, that's about 12 percent, depending on the teacher and depending on how they move. Um, that's 12 percent to 13 percent raises over three years. The thing that's difficult about that for me is that our CPI increases define our revenue stream. So our revenue stream is only growing at one and a half against 3.7, three against 4.3, and two against 3.7. Simply put, we're spending more on raises than our revenues are growing. And even if you do an 80% metric for salaries and benefits, just you know, a quick number, if we do <clears throat> in the first year, 3.7, let's round it up to four and then let's round up our, our CPI for simple math purposes. And let's just use $100 as a, as a simple number. If 80% of our number, if 80% of our expenses are salaries and benefits and they grow at something around four, that means the first year into the contract, <coughs> our costs start at 80, grow at 4%, that's 83.2. If our revenues <clears throat> grow at three, then our, our total new revenues are 103. So again, we're spending more money than we're taking in in terms of revenue growth, which by definition simply means this. It means we will deplete reserves. And we will deplete reserves fairly substantially for three straight years. Um, that can only mean that we either have to start talking about our revenues or we have to start talking about spending cuts and budget cuts. Um, 
you know, and, and keeping in mind that we've already lost languages and a tech person and a curriculum director and half of our department heads, half of our department heads. Um, so more cuts are ominous to me. Um, they're difficult, and uh, you know, I, I don't think they're appropriate. Um, with respect to the compensation itself, and I think there's community conversation about it, and so I want to be open about it and transparent about it. Spent a fair amount of time um, looking at the question as well between the um, school report cards and the interactive, uh, the Northern Illinois interactive report card data, as well as the ISBE salary <coughs> um, report. The thing that was disappointing to me about the demonstrations and about the strike vote was it felt and I've struggled with the right word to describe it. And the only one that, can, that comes to mind that, that sort of fits, not entirely, but sort of, is disingenuous in this sense. We were down to a conversation about compensation. And the question, you know, the question, the, the demonstrations and the strike vote would lead community members who aren't fully informed to believe that somehow or other teachers weren't being fairly compensated. And I think it's important to say out loud, not just that we fairly compensate our teachers, um, by any measure, by any measure, we compensate our teachers excellently. On average, the average teacher at Westbound CUSD 201 earns more than any other unit district teacher in the state. That said, they are also the longest tenured of uh, unit districts, and they have 84% master's degrees. So in fairness to the teachers, they are excellently qualified, long tenured. So you would expect some of that. So the question at hand is, vis-a-vis -vis the schedule, the salary schedule, is the salary schedule competitive? In short, at BA1, <clears throat> there are only two districts that exceed our BA1 in unit districts. At MA-10, it's only one, Chicago. And Chicago only has 13 steps to our 20, so they max out at 90 on their schedule versus our 101 max. Um, and then at MA-48, at the outer edge of the schedules, it's hard to compare districts to districts because some districts go as long as 34 and 35 steps to our 20. Some districts only go to MA32 or MA24 versus our MA48, and some districts go out to doctorate. <clears throat> Suffice to say, <clears throat> at our maximum schedule, at MA48 and 20 years, we started, you know, before this contract, that number was just under $101,000, which puts us approximately, at, at that point, M, at MA, at the outer edge and 20 years in, it puts us fourth highest in the state by schedule, by stated maximum. I think it's important that we acknowledge that we have excellent teachers and that they're paid appropriately. They're paid exceptionally well. Um, which you know, creates a conflict for me personally in light of the fact that we live and work in a district where 40% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunches. If last year's school report card had an average salary of just under $87,000 for, for, for per teacher, then at the end of this contract, the likely average uh, salary for teachers will be $95,000 plus or minus. Um, I realize that it, it's not lost on me that um, I'm offending a lot of people, but um, as I reach the end or close to the end of my service to this district, I think I would be remiss not simply to be open about where we are, about who we are, and about what we're doing. So uh, for purposes of the notes, what I'd like reflected is that my, my vote is going to be no because I don't believe it's a responsible contract because I think we're spending more money than we're growing by. Our raises grow more, more quickly than our revenues, and I don't think that's good for our district. Um, but I also realize that we have deeply committed people who will work hard to figure out 
what that means, but we and the leadership on this board and the leadership of this district will have a very real problem to deal with very soon. So. Are there any other comments? <coughs> yes. Um, just briefly, I, I do believe that the results of this evening will allow us to return to a focus on educating children and, and at the end of the day that's certainly a very positive outcome in any scenario. Um, I hope to continue to see the support and participation at board meetings and with board level activities that we've seen in recent uh, board meetings. I'm also pleased that um, over the last many years the board has been successful in controlling costs and doing some positive things to try to rein in what has been deficit spending for more years than every single one of us has been sitting here. Um, I am, however, concerned that the mediated agreement doesn't represent a fiscal, fiscally responsible approach. Um, it doesn't help to support the recent successes we have had financially with controlling costs and maintaining some of those um, efforts. And I don't think that it allows as much financial room for us as a board to focus on reintroducing curriculum that's currently missing in our district, as well as expanding programs that we may like to expand. So. I just wanted to have that on the record that I'm, I'm concerned fiscally about the results of this mediated agreement. Thank you. Hey, Marie, do you, I, I have. Hmm? Uh, do you want to go? Yeah, I'll go ahead okay, and go, go now ahead. since everyone's adding their comments. Um, and I, I wrote a statement kind of on behalf of Gary and myself. There's a lot of eyes in here because I didn't have time to go through it, unfortunately, and, and add the we's that were necessary. So um, bear with that. but. Um, since Gary and I served on the negotiating team, I would like to uh, go ahead and read this statement. And I kind of started it out with, um, with a very simple quote, and it's actually from Walt Disney. And that quote is, our greatest natural resource is the minds of our children. It states so much, so simply. I think it's a quote that all in this room and all in our community, community can agree upon. Aside from the guidance <clears throat> and love we provide our children as parents, a very influential factor shaping our children's lives is the formal education they are provided. I'm proud of the highly qualified and dedicated teaching staff we have in District 201. Our teachers are very committed to developing, improving, and maximizing our greatest natural resource, the minds of 201's children. I'm sure we can all name specific 201 teachers who have profoundly impacted our children's academic and social-emotional growth in very positive and sometimes very personal ways. We need to acknowledge and value the challenging roles our teachers fill, not only as instructors, but as mentors, role models, caregivers, and in some cases, substitute parents. The challenges for teachers trying to fill all these roles are endless. I certainly appreciate and recognize our teaching staff for all you do to meet the needs of each child in our district. Thank you. In regards to the negotiated contract, I believe it is important to clarify some of the process that took almost 10 months and was at times frustrating for parents, teachers, and board members. I've been through two WTA contract negotiations. In each case, the process was the, was the same. The board seeks two to three members willing to volunteer as represent representatives for the negotiation team. For these negotiations, Mr. Armstrong and I were the members who stepped forward. Being the board, board's representatives means we were obligated to negotiate based on the direction and input from all seven board members. Therefore, over the course of numerous negotiation sessions, Gary and I went back and forth between the negotiating table and the board table. We functioned as messengers between the WTA and the whole board and helped convey the thoughts of all seven board members during negotiation sessions. Each time a district negotiates a contract, unique issues have the highest importance. Sometimes it's leadership and language. Sometimes it's salary and benefits or any combination. These negotiations had few leadership and language concerns expressed at the table. To me, that is a clear indication that the workplace culture has greatly improved over the past several years. That is a credit to our administration, a benefit for our employees, and supports the positive climate that we want for our students. 
Despite the sacrifice the WTA made by accepting a hard and soft freeze during the last contract, and despite over 250000 in new revenues awarded through successful teacher and administrator collaborative grant proposals, our district still must be exceptionally mindful about our long-term financial forecast. Therefore, from the board's perspective, two specific compensation goals were of significant importance. Number one, exploring options to include a merit com component to compensation. And two, more effectively tying compensation increases to the consumer price index. With regard to the performance or merit pay component, there were a number of thoughts shared, but with the new performance-based parameters being implemented as outlined in Senate Bill 7, <clears throat> impacting teacher layoff, recall, and tenure, plus the implementation of a newly collaboratively developed teacher evaluation tool, it was decided that all staff will need to become familiar with these new performance-based changes before further merit pay discussions could become productive. With regard to the tie to CPI, each year of this contract is tied to a percent of CPI. CPI drives new revenue and therefore must limit new expenditures. This is an important break from past practice where our district offered a flat percentage increase for each year of a multi-year contract. Even with the tie to CPI, District 201 still provides a very competitive salary structure that will continue to attract and keep highly talented professionals. Sometimes the best compromise is one where everyone walks away from the table a little bit dissatisfied. It is possible that this may be the case for some. From the board side of negotiations, I was very pleased with our board's closed session discussion during our 1113 school board meeting. Six board members weighed the big picture options and outcomes. Each supported a consensus position for the negotiating team to take into the final mediations. The seventh board member later provided additional feedback to the team leader concerning the consensus position. At the final scheduled mediation session, all board members were on the same page in providing unified direction to the negotiating team. Finally, I want to thank the members of the WTA negotiating team, Ms. Riley, Mr. Prisney, Ms. Kaplan, Ms. Lyston. I felt our negotiations were always professional and pleasant. I also want to thank Kevin, who led the board's negotiating team. Kim, who developed some very creative compensation scenarios for consideration during negotiations, and Gary for volunteering with me. I was glad to have Diane, Marie, and Mary Kay join the negotiating team's final mediation session to help facilitate closure. I believe this contract provides a novel framework for future negotiations and is a contract that is in the current best interest of our entire 201 community. Thank you. Then I have a, a statement too. Tonight on our agenda and before this board is the action item to approve our contract with our teachers. Earlier today, the WTA met and did vote to ratify this contract. The process before us is that the teachers union ratifies first and then the board meets to do the same. Hence, this special meeting was called and we will shortly vote on this. I also want to take a moment to thank the negotiating teams on behalf of the WTA and the Board of Education and especially our representatives Joel Price and Gary Armstrong. There have been numerous long meetings beginning in February and much time has been devoted to completing this process. I want to thank our negotiating team for constantly informing the board of the progress as time went on and for consistently representing the direction of the board at the negotiation table. The whole process of negotiating a collective bargaining agreement can sometimes be very difficult. But I can say that it is my opinion that the agreement that we came to is a fair one. Our teachers are getting a raise that they desire and at the same time, this board has been fiscally responsible with our tax dollars. The details of the agreement will be available on the district website soon, and a press release will be going out shortly. But for the first time, there is an agreement that ties raises to the CPI. What this means is that the district will be able to budget predictably and with an eye to the future. As a school district, we are a public body. 
and our revenue comes primarily from tax dollars. We are limited in the amount of tax dollars that we can collect. Everything we do is paid for from tax dollars, most. So we have to truly think before we spend. In the private sector, there is, an always op there is always an opportunity to raise costs. But we are not making car parts or widgets here. <clears throat> we are educating children, and our income is limited. I again commend both parties for reaching a settlement that is based on a percentage of CPI. No matter what the agreement <clears throat> is that was reached, there will be some criticism, but I guess that goes with the territory. The issues of our global economy, our country's union debate, our academic changes, and our overall fiscal cliff worries are not going to be solved first right here in District 201. However, this board and this administration and this staff and this community are going to continue to make strides toward becoming the small giant that we can be. We are going to look at what is in front of us and face these issues head on. We are going to continue to move our district forward, even with the conditions that we have to struggle through. We are going to put our collective minds together and find solutions to our issues. Again, I commend the WTA and the Board of Education for negotiating a su successful agreement. I appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. Briefly, um, based on Mr. Carey's confidence that we can make this contract work, I favor its approval. I would like to, however, see that the Board address the schedule in the future conversations as it is not I feel sustainable in long term. Lastly, I'd like to extend my thanks to the negotiating team for their diligence and perseverance in bringing these negotiations to a successful close. For nine months at every turn, the board was kept abreast of the negotiations, and the negotiating team brought the board's concerns and desires to the negotiating table. I believe that. <clears throat> After a very laborious and sometimes uncomfortable negotiation, both sides came away with a fair and reasonable contract. And I'm comfortable with how the district was represented at the table and grateful for the time the teams on both sides of the table invested in this very important undertaking. So thank you very much. Okay, are we ready to vote? Okay. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the negotiated agreement between the Board of Education of Community Unit School District 201 and the Westmont Teachers Association for the 2012 through 2013, 2013 through 2014, and 2014 through 2015 school years as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Charleston? No. Mrs. Hancock? Yes. Mrs. Charlton? Yes. Ms. Caparelli? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Mr. Armstrong? Yes. Congratulations, we have a, an agreement. And as we said, a press release will be going out uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. tomorrow. And then as soon as the, as soon as the um, agreement is finalized and everything, it will be posted on the website for everyone. Okay, the next item. Uh, discussion, Westmont High School course recommendations. We have Mr. Balderman here for that. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present this information. <clears throat> so what you have in front of you is the uh, course proposals, just a brief overview, a summary it is going to be presented in this PowerPoint here. What you've been provided in a PDF file is some background information. So tonight I'm just going to do a quick overview and I mean a really brief summary. Of course any questions you have tonight I would entertain. If I can answer them I will. If I can't I'll go back and get the answers. Uh, between now and the next reading which I believe is December the 18th. Um, if you would please any questions or concerns if you could give those to Kevin and then Kevin will forward them to me and then I would uh, get the answers to you from our teachers and also at the December 18th meeting uh, the teachers will be available to answer questions in person. Is that uh, agreeable? Is that f fine? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm really excited about this. Um, 
we, we had a few different objectives. Uh, primarily, some of the concerns that we're addressing are um, looking at a more rigorous curriculum opportunities for our students, and also uh, some more innovative curriculum opportunities and uh, innovative instruction by our teachers for our students. And uh, those are the, and we, of course, we believe that while there be some costs incurred, that overall, and I'd like to go into detail about that, this is not, even though there's a, a I think a wealth of courses and a number of new options, it's not really gonna have that great of an impact, uh, economically speaking, and I can explain that. So, here's an overview of the courses. First of all, uh, just to go over them very briefly, the account, Honors Accounting 1 and 2 and Honors Advanced Accounting 1 and 2 is simply providing the students an option of doing additional work that the teacher would provide so they would get an honors credit instead of a regular credit. So really, if you can imagine, the current classroom would have 25 students. The teacher would outline a curriculum that would be a little bit different than the traditional curriculum with uh, enrichment opportunities, and then students could elect to be a part of that and earn honors credit instead of the regular credit. So it's really a cost neutral proposal, but it gives students a chance to do some enrichment and earn the honors credit, a little more rigorous curriculum. I'm sorry, it's not a separate class, it's differentiation within? Exactly, yes. Okay. Um, the college readiness class is something that we did on a pilot basis already this semester, and I appreciate your support. I think we're having some good success with that. It's Really, what we do is we do some diagnostic testing using Explore and Plan scores and Practice AT ACT scores, identify students who have some skill deficiencies in their junior year, and then try to remediate those deficiencies uh, through formative assessments and pinpointing instruction to specific learning gaps and getting students to be able to uh, address some of the things they're going to need to be successful on the assessments that we're responsible for. but. It's not just test strategies, it's really looking at skill development and, and filling some content needs the students have. Uh, and by doing so, we're anticipating that they'll perform better on the assessments that are required by the state and by the federal government. So that's the focus of the college readiness class. It's in a pilot stage right now. Um, it's too early to really, we don't have much data, we have some data, we're tracking it extremely closely um, and we'll do so throughout the rest of the year. Um, we only have one practice test that has uh, come after the initial uh, benchmarking, but that's too early to tell. But we will track this carefully, but we believe it'll do a few things, first of all, a better uh, fill some gaps in our students' learning, but furthermore, increase their success uh, for the gatekeeping exams that really have an impact on their life. So that's the focus of college readiness. But I want to make clear, it's not just a test prep class it really focuses more importantly i think on content and skill development for, that students need jack who's that available to is it all grade levels or well as, it, based or? as it's proposed um we would offer to any junior who was interested and juniors only and here's what happens some of our students for instance uh choose to do more traditional test prep when in their junior year and they pay a lot of money for that frankly um but and, and their will that option is still available to them some of our students though a few things i could see happening if you're a, a three sport athlete and who's still in the band or something how are you going to have time in the evenings to spend on test prep so this would be a chance for them to get the test prep and the skill development during the day and for some of our so that's one option that's one uh, student who might be in this program. Another one who's really skill deficient and we need to do some s significant remediation and so we would do that during their time. So that would be to the point where the counselors are even recommending this as an elective for that type of student in their junior year? Yes. Now that doesn't mean that we're not addressing those needs prior to the junior year. We should be addressing them. In fact, uh, we're doing some articulation with uh, the junior high uh, math team. The high school and junior high math teams are joining together uh, next Monday for a few hours, and we hope to develop an exit exam so we can identify what the learning gaps are when they're coming to us as ninth graders and building remediations in from the time we first uh, received them. But this is just one more uh, intervention in the process. Are you, um, you said it's in a pilot program right now. Yes. How many 
do you know how many students are taking advantage of this right now? It's close to 50. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. And we have a really solid data. We have their plan scores from sophomore year, which is in part how we identify the students. We have practice uh, ACT data. Then we have another full uh, practice ACT. And so we can monitor their progress. We plan on giving a partial practice ACT in December, a full one in January, a full one in February, and possibly a full one in March. So we can see over time, we'll have a spreadsheet to see the impact of this course. And we have some students who decided not to participate, who are not participating, so we can kind of see if there's any difference in growth between the students who participated and those who didn't. So we, we're really tracking this carefully and we'll be able, we won't know for certain until next June, realistically, when we get their PSAE scores back, but then we will have a series of tests and we'll see where the students were projected to land, where they actually land, if the students in the course, if it made a difference or not. I have one more question. You, you mentioned that it's not just test prep. Could you give us either an example of a goal or an activity that isn't test prep? Because you just listed like, what, six times they're taking the test, um, which is great. I mean, I think that's valuable and important. But I'm curious if we're billing this as college readiness, do you have any ideas or examples of what that might look like beyond all of the test work? So when we give a practice exam, we get formative data. As an example, there's certain questions that are consistent on the ACT over time, and we'll be able to identify what the specific learning gaps of the students are. So for instance, in the math portion, if they're not getting the FOIL concept, if they're not getting linear equations, if they're struggling with fractions, then we don't just teach them test-taking strategies. For instance, um, you know, process of elimination, or skim the passage, read the questions, read the passage, or eliminate one passage, those would be the, the test taking strategy types. Instead, we'll pinpoint the instruction to making sure that we go over fractions because that's something that's expected from Common Core, from the assessments, from the, the national and state assessments, and uh, those are the state standards we're supposed to be hitting. If kids haven't hit them, then instead of just teaching them, for instance, read three out of the four ACT passages would be a strategy really getting at the specific skill deficiencies they had would be what we're trying to do in this course. Okay. I'm not saying it's void of test taking strategies, but it's more of a focus on getting them to the skill remediation. Okay. And, and does the same intervention, it's an intervention as cover math, reading, it's, it's It's primarily math, reading, and science. There is some English involved. Now we're also, to be known, it's all, we're also integrating all of this information into our courses too. And we have, the counselors doing a great job, they're meeting with every junior currently and giving them a menu of options to choose from for test prep if that's what they want to do. So they can choose Kaplan, they can choose some program we have called ZAPS, which is kind of an intense program, a one day program. We'll run our own test prep program through the school. So they have different options they can choose. Academic support is another uh, program that's in a pilot stage. We're identifying our most um, uh, in need students, our students who are most at risk, who have uh, multiple failures. And on a daily basis, we have um, a gentleman who's doing a, fanta a fantastic job for us, uh, Matt Popolarczyk, who is uh, meeting with those students trying to keep them on track. He's their mentor, he's the tutor. He push, you know, pushes them, keeps them motivated. He's the liaison between home and school. Um, he's the liaison between teachers and students. And he has a core group of students who are struggling the most. Now this is a non-credit class, but it's, we're putting it up as a new course proposal, even though it's in a pilot stage. And once again, we're tracking the data to see what kind of impact it's had on these students. But not only is this, um, so, he, he, Matt also coordinates on Wednesdays students who are failing, teachers get work to him and then he divvies it out to the teaching assistants and the students and then they're required to stay when the other students are released to get additional help. And as of uh, yesterday, we had about 85 students who stayed the extra hour to get additional help. Um, so that's the academic support class, which once again is really targeting students and the philosophy is 
we have a very small handful of students, it's less than 5%, it's maybe even less than 3%, but who are failing multiple classes, two, three, four classes. They've proven to us they can't deal with seven classes. So instead of just piling it on them, have them take six and have them have this last class as the place where they can make up work, get help, and get uh, some support on a daily basis. I kid around, but I'm serious. I wish I had academic support. Because for 14 and 15 year olds who aren't disciplined enough, who are procrastinators, who aren't good at organization, they have somebody there as an advocate for them every day to kind of get them going. I mean, I wish I had that some days, you know, to kind of, you know, push me on certain projects, make sure I'm following through. And then that'll lead to less failures, more success. Because one of our top SMART goals is the graduation rate of, you know, we want all of our students to graduate, but to be you know, to maximize graduation rate. And this is one of the interventions to make that happen. Is this a voluntary, voluntary or mandatory? Well, if a student, I mean, we usually meet with parents and students and then we highly suggest it. Okay. And um, it, the, most of the parents are very receptive to it. And sometimes the students are too, because they know they're struggling and then they take a little bit off their plate and they're getting more support. Sure. Right. Is this accredited class? Would it be? No. It's not. I would like to offer credit, but really, since it doesn't have a curriculum, it's kind of hard to justify that. Fine. Okay. Um, the music history, you know, f just to be frank about it, sometimes because we've had some change in personnel in our uh, fine arts department, sometimes the courses that are de have been developed over time kind of fit the strengths of the individuals. For instance, you know, the music program at the high school, because of our size, which is, is a great strength in many ways, but it, the music department is the teacher. He's the person teaching it, or she could be. Same with the art department in the, in the uh, choral program. So courses have been developed that are kind of meet the specific talents of those teachers in the past. When that personnel leaves, we have to make some adjustments in curriculum because of our size. So in part, I think the music history course could be taught by any music educator, but it kind of fits the strengths of our current personnel and I think it would garner some interest from a broad range of students, not just music students. If you look at the descriptions, um, you know, there's a course on jazz and blues and, and rock and roll and so forth, a semester course, where students could learn music history and fulfill their fine arts requirement. But it would be, uh, you know, open to all students and uh, the course description is there. Okay. Go to this? This <laughs> exactly. I, I think I would enjoy that too. But exactly. that's seniors only, right? You know what? I think that's open to. Uh, I think it's seniors it's only. College bound seniors. Yeah. Is it all students? Well, you think? Well, yeah. It's it's primarily for the seniors who are yes. The next, I'm going to bundle the next group a little bit in saying that. I really believe in the power of advanced placement classes for a multitude of reasons. First of all, it's a national curriculum that has gained the approval of not only teachers from across the nation, uh, including some of our own, but of the college and university system. So, and as far as the assessments goes, for a national assessment, it's one of the better assessments, one of the more authentic assessments. It's not just multiple choice tests. Um, I like the idea of in an advanced placement course, teacher and student are kind of working together to make sure the student does well on the test. And I, I like that aspect of it. It is highly rigorous in the sense that, um, you know, if you look at uh, answers in the toolbox report that says that um, they highly recommend, this is a, a report that was compiled over 20 years time that the best thing we can do to make sure that our students earn a bachelor's degree is to give them a rigorous curriculum in their high school experience. And that uh, the report flat out says, and I can get you a summary of the report, or I could provide you with the report, it says, you know, take AP courses and don't shy away from them. Take the challenge. Be best prepared. You can't really be over prepared for the collegiate experience. In, with that being said, our teachers, and we've had this discussion, we have to do it in an environment where it's going to be supportive of our students. So we've got that balance. We're not just pushing students into a rigorous situation without support. So there has to be a culture where we know we're raising the bar and expectations for students, but simultaneously giving them the supports that they need to be successful. 
And once again, the students that are, that are students uh, from 201 will be sitting next to in a collegiate environment. Um, will be, will, many of them will have had at least the opportunity to have been exposed to advanced placement. So I don't want our students not to have that opportunity. Um, and so we want to expand the offerings. And from a cost perspective, there will be some staff development costs, and there will be some minor um, you know, materials costs. But the way we're envisioning it, and the way that we're going to have to follow through on is, if we have 100 sophomores next year, we would probably run four sections of world history. Instead, we'll run two sections of AP world history and two sections of regular world history. So that should be a cost-neutral proposal, as far as that's concerned, not adding sections. Um, so to go through them briefly, we have the AP Studio Art, which really um, is something we're proposing here tonight. We would like to have it on the books. We think it would be, once again, something that we may or may not offer next year, but it would be done within our regular art course. Does that make sense? So students could opt to take AP and put together an AP portfolio. The AP Statistics, we already offer statistics to seniors. This would be an AP version. Separate class or within the existing statistics? That would be a separate class. But once again, if we offered two sections of statistics this year, um, so we have 0.4 FT dedicated to statistics, then next year we would offer 0.4 in AP statistics. It would not be, uh, once again, cost neutral. Um, the AP world history, as I just described. We're going to encourage our sophomores, and we've got a lot of data and research that if you're interested, I could present to you that shows that students in our region are taking this course as freshmen sometimes and as sophomores and having success. Um, so, and it, once again, it would be cost neutral in the sense that we wouldn't be offering smaller sections or smaller numbers. We're going to encourage our students to take this and get enough of the class to be able to partake in this. Uh, the AP American government is primarily um, a senior class, almost excuse, uh, exclusively. The one unique thing we're doing here is that we're, uh, we're proposing it as a year-long course. And that will allow for some more innovative curriculum and also the opportunity for students maybe who would struggle a little bit to have some additional time and practice within the course. Um, the AP environmental science is probably the most accessible of the AP science courses. And because we have some unique options at Westmont High School, uh, this was the one that was chosen first. So students who want to take advanced placement during their uh, high school career in science would have that opportunity. I think it's a very timely course. It's more accessible than the physics and the chemistry, as an example. Um, and I, I think it's something that would be of interest to our students, too. Um, the, the last course is really uh, the medical science course is already on the books. It's just a little bit different phraseology there for the uh, advanced biology and medical science. Forensic science, we already have a forensics one that Laurie Erasmus has done some great work with and work with the FBI Academy. And this is the second semester to continue the work they do in the first semester. It's an elective. It fulfills the science graduation requirement. But most of these students are choosing this class as an elective. So we'll run if, if, if students choose to take it, and it won't if it doesn't. The science food and nutrition course is, once again, it's an elective course. It will run if it has the right numbers of students. It really is focused on the idea that we want to promote good health amongst our students and that this is an important lifelong skill they need to develop. So, uh, And it takes the uh, scientific approach and does some of the research behind food and nutrition. Uh, the last one, th to me, that I really think is our goal is to have it closely aligned with our um, some of the really unique aspects of the small giant vision is the course called Change Makers. And um, I don't know if people had a chance to see the, the 60 minutes from last Sunday. There was a, a, a f one of the segments dealt with young students really dreaming big. And part of what we want to do in Change Makers is really focus on what we talk about in the small giant's vision. Make it project-based, make it student-centered, authentic learning, give students choices, and really get them to have a chance to dream. So the idea is if a student has some kind of a passion or a dream that they want to enact, that they would be able to take this course and make something very unique happen. Um, so it's unconventional in the sense that it doesn't start off with a completely set 
of, of learning targets in a curriculum. It's a little more flexible than that. We are confident that students will hit Common Core standards in the course of doing this. But for instance, one of the course, one of the one of the proposals is there's a young woman at our high school who wants to start a foundation for students in need. So she would have to go through and do the research, develop a vision, um, and then take action and put it in the real world. Find out what it takes to actually start a foundation. What are the, the things that are required for fundraising? Um, you know, I don't want to make any promises, but you know, we talked about students possibly starting you know, a, a, a small farm of some kind where they could grow vegetables, sell it at a farmer's market, maybe donate the, the proceeds to building a greenhouse. The students could possibly donate the food to a local shelter. We could maybe use the food in our own cafeteria. But the students would have to go through all of the legwork to make things like that happen. It's really only limited by the imaginations of our students. But through the process, they would learn how to deal with contemporary media. Uh, they would have to do significant research. They would have to take action based on that research. So, um, and as I say, the unique thing about it is that it's really driven by student interest and by, um, by student um, skills and strengths and vision. I just have a quick question, Jack, kind of an overall. You're talking about adding honors and AP. I think that's wonderful. Have we talked to any of the local community colleges to see if this additional curriculum or, or the, the level that we're going to be teaching it, is it something that they would want to see our students doing? Is it, do you see what I'm saying, what I'm driving at there? Is it something that the colleges are saying, oh, yeah, that's a good program, that's what a college-ready student would need to do? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're looking at having our students best prepared. So let's say regardless of where our student lands after they leave Westmont, they'll be better prepared if they've engaged in that rigorous curriculum. So it, did we ask, I mean, have we actually talked to like COD or any of the other? Yeah, I mean, I will say this. I mean, we've talked to COD, but I mean, I've talked for years to college admissions. Every time one of our college admissions, we we've, a beautiful thing we've had about uh, close to two dozen different representatives from local colleges and colleges across the, uh, the Midwest come and uh, spend their lunch hours to recruit our students. And without exception, I'll ask them, how important is it for our students, you know, for their preparation? How much do you value seeing a student having AP on their transcript? Without exception, they talk about the importance. They'll look at a student's class rank. They'll look at their standardized test scores. But probably the third most important criteria is, has the student availed themselves of the most rigorous curriculum possible at their school? So this is something that's a high priority for admissions people at the collegiate level. And for, I mean, once again, I mean, it, the college professors that we've spoken to, the admissions people say, you can't over prepare your students for that experience. Change makers. Okay, so the kids solicit their own advisor. Yes. And I could see that this could end up being a very popular pro, because I really love this idea. Um, how do you find the advisor? You know, I mean, are you gonna run out of advisors if you've got 85 kids signed up for this class, or? If we had, I would be, our, we are thinking that we're gonna have, and here's an important, we think we're gonna have a half a dozen to a dozen students. Now, I hope we're wrong. I hope it is what you say. Um, but it, if, if it's more than one section, I think for the first year, we will be in a little bit of a dilemma. We're thinking we're going to offer one section the first year. And the person that we're um, anticipating teaching this is uh, our, uh, our media specialist, uh, Michelle Teresi, who's done some great legwork uh, putting this together and really has an excellent vision for this. And so once again, in a sense, there, it won't be FTE intensive. It will allow for her to teach it, and it won't have an a impact on our FTE. Sure. If we had 80 students sign up for this, um, yeah, that would be a challenge, but what a great challenge. If we had all of our students who could, who had passion, who had vision, and we were able to take what they were really most interested in and make it happen. So that would be a beautiful problem to have. Yeah. Uh, we'll find a way to make that happen. You know, they, they they're not limited to just the advisors. This is part of the idea of the real world learning. It doesn't just have to be their, the teachers in our building. They could seek advisors to help them with this project from the community or from a university or 
The sky's the limit on that. Mm -hmm. Do you think in that? Oh, go ahead. Go do ahead. you envision that being um, both individual or students working in teams? Because clearly, if you're doing a greenhouse or some sort of project like that, you it seems you would have to have more than one student involved for it to be successful. Yeah, that would be great. That's what we really hope. I mean, it's a common. We're going to present this in a way to say, students, what are your dreams? What are your passions? What are you most excited about? Would you like to make that happen? Are you willing to do the legwork, the research? This is going to have a certain level of rigor. Um, and it ha you have to be, have a certain level of self-discipline to make this course happen. It's not going to just be pushed to you. You have to develop some of this. So, um, but absolutely. I hope there are a small group of students who want to take on a project. It, and it could be, any we have, a few students right now, it's one of our students who has some pretty uh, serious physical challenges uh, to meet uh, Julie Andrews, just as an example. I know, but that's something she's very interested in. So these students took on this challenge of uh, doing some research, contacting Julie Andrews' manager, and trying to connect these two people, either through a, a visit or through you know Skyping or something. And so we thought, why could, you know, that's just small scale, that wouldn't be a whole course. But those kinds of things really try, and, and they learn through the process. They have to write, they have to do the research, they have to do the connection, the networking, all the things that would come to make something like that happen, somebody else's dream happen. So yeah, I hope that if there's a group of students who would say, we really think this is important, there's a social issue we're really interested in, that they would band together and then we would support them, kind of facilitate and guide them through that process. That would be wonderful. I'm curious, how does this show up on transcripts, this class? What does See, it look like? Having been in the high school game and dealt with admissions officers across the country for years, I think this is what really can be a difference maker for our kids, and I'll tell you why. Because if, if you are uh, applying to an elite school or a selective school and you're trying to gain admission, almost everybody's going to have the same portfolio, good test scores, good grades, and have taken AP courses or honors level courses. But what really can distinguish you as a college applicant is that you've done something where you've developed your own project. So, I mean, it'll show up as change makers, and then I would hope if they have success, they can talk about the project they're doing. And I think that might actually a selection, it may grab a selection committee's uh, you know, attention that this student showed innovation, had a vision, and did something unique. That takes a lot more work than just, even though it's a lot of work, sitting in another you know, AP Cal class, as rigorous as that is, of, everybody's going to have that. Not, many students are not going to be able to say, I attempted to start my own foundation, or there was, uh, you know, a food pantry in the local area that needed support, and so I started fundraising for them, or just whatever students are passionate about. You know, I just, I, that was kind of where I was, this change makers definitely looks like something that could be, that could set us apart. Um, having spent a lot of time this summer actually going and talking to colleges and stuff, this is actually one of those things that you would, first of all, you'd have a student who um, was emotion, uh, t very emotionally tied into it in some way, if they brought the project. So you could see that, you know, think about the college transcripts, how many they get. And if everybody has the same class, again, it's there. But to have something that is a, a finalized product at the end, whatever that is, however you measure it, um, I, I would think that that would be something that would set you apart from uh, many other people. Um, and I, I would just say that, you know, I was thinking along the lines of, of Mary Kay, too. It would be interesting to see how many students partake of this. Um, and I would really love it, you know, to the extent we can, at the end of the year, maybe to have a board presentation from a couple of these students that are very proud of it. Then they could do a synopsis of what they're doing. Something along that line. I don't know if it's a, a board presentation. Some, some way to then take it to the next level, like, look what I did. Um, Absolutely. But this, I, this does sound, and the, all the AP courses, I mean, they're, they certainly sound like you know, I can see, think back to when I was in school, thinking of the classes that were <coughs> offered. Some of these classes really do sound, you know, not only rigorous, but in an area that the students might really enjoy, which would be spectacular. I hope so. 
Jack, is curriculum development started on some or all of these courses? And if you could touch on who's going to do that and how that's going to be managed. Sure. Um, so, yeah, this is exciting. The Honors Accounting and Honors Advanced Accounting, Bridget Durbin is a longtime teacher of this, of this work. But one of the neat things she's doing in her PLC is um, because she's the only business teacher at the high school, she's actually built a, a cyber PLC with some local uh, high school districts, Wabansi Valley and, and Naperville, where she has a connection. So she's sharing materials, sharing curriculum, and learning with those um, fellow teachers. So that she's already an experienced teacher, but she's enhancing what she knows with some local professionals, which really takes that PLC idea to the next level. I'm very proud of the work she's doing there. Um, the AP classes, uh, Kevin and I have the last few months met about every six weeks with a consortium of superintendents and principals and some AP teachers who are um, pretty accomplished and kind of brainstorm about ideas and so forth. And one of the things that we've talked about is um, bringing um, a group of advanced placement teachers together and doing some work this upcoming summer, uh, hosting a conference where it would be a series of uh, local districts who would each contribute a little bit of money and then we could pool our resources and bring all these AP teachers together to learn from each other. So, um, you know, it, which is really a cost effective way and I think more powerful. Instead of sending somebody off every summer, which I think sometimes is needed, but a way we can bring the best teachers in, this, in their region together to learn from each other. So, for instance, in the AP world history, Don Kemmerling is a very popular teacher, a very dedicated teacher, and a very talented teacher. His only concern is he doesn't know the AP curriculum. So we've found two of the best AP world history teachers in the state to kind of work with him and mentor him. So that's one of the things we're doing. Uh, same with the AP government. A small group of our uh, social studies teachers are going to actually visit a group of uh, veteran teachers at Sandberg High School coming up in a couple of weeks, just spending a couple hours there and going and meeting with these teachers and seeing them teach a class and then brainstorming with them afterwards. And they're sharing curriculum, they're sharing their best practices, and then they'll establish uh, like a cyber community where they can constantly share with each other. So that, those are, in addition to some traditional staff development, we're really trying to get our teachers to form larger PLC networks so they can learn from each other. So but the idea is that they're going to network with other professionals who are already doing these these AP level courses or the other courses. Yes. But then they, you know, then they'll be empowered and um, you know, tasked with developing the, the curriculum for Westmont, is that it? Yes. Okay. Um and how does I mean so once those curriculums are developed, do they go through Kevin? I forget. They, do they go through you and then Kevin? Is that how that? I forget how that works. For approval of the curriculum, right. And the other um, thing that we have as well is we have uh, we've uh, formed a curriculum advisory council. Okay. So that group as well would have an opportunity to review it. The other thing with AP is, which is really a huge advantage of advanced placement. If you, if you call your class AP and you put on your transcripts, you have to go through a very rigorous auditing process that's approved by the college board. So the teacher has to submit their um, curriculum and their credentials, and the only way you can call it AP nowadays is if it's approved by the college board. Yeah. So that's another support system and check and balance. And am I correct that um, some of these classes, at the end, you can take a test that would give you college credit? I mean, like, there's a, it's, it's not just taking the class, but it's, can you talk about that just for a second? Sure. Mm -hmm. If students take the advanced placement test, and this varies from university to university, but there is the potential that they, if they uh, get to a certain level of proficiency, that they could clep out of their um, college requirements. So, it's it's conceivable that students could almost complete a full year's worth of college during their senior year or their sophomore, junior, senior year of high school. Now, it, it varies. There's, you know, the, the tests are graded one to five. Three is generally considered a pass. Some colleges will take a three, but nowadays you have to score a four or five to earn college credit in most cases. But those at universities across the country, including some of the best colleges in America, if you pass that exam, you can possibly earn credit. 
or at least clep out of classes at the collegiate level. And just to follow up on what you're talking at the next meeting about, um, are you saying to bring in a couple of these teachers to talk with us at the next? It, yes, the teachers are very willing to come. I guess what I'm asking for is if there are any questions that we, if we get those questions in the next couple of weeks, then I can get those to the teachers and the teachers can bring specific questions and answers to the December 18th meeting. And if there's anybody who you think you really want to talk to in depth, the teachers have all said they'll come on the 18th and because, you know, I can answer the general questions, but the specifics, the teachers are much better qualified to answer those questions. So they will come on the 18th um, if you want them to. And in between now and then, please give us any questions you have so we can get those answered. And you had said something about an AP summary. Could you give that to us? You said that you had some um, research and you have a summary of that? Sure. Is we were. You have something. I'm yeah. not asking you to go write anything, but. No, no, no. It, uh, yeah. The main thing I would give you is a summary of probably the most comprehensive research that's been done on what it takes for students to complete a bachelor's degree. Because as we know, about a third of the students who start at four year colleges uh, come home and don't return to the four year college after their first year. And only about 55% of students who start at a four year college actually complete within six years. <laughs> So we lose, just because we send them there doesn't mean that they're going to be successful. And the best way we can get them f ready for BA completion is to give them the rigorous curriculum. So there's a study called Answers in the Toolbox that's been conducted over 25 years. And I'll get you a, a summary and the website for the, the link for the research. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's it on our agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion, um, meeting adjourned.